Yeah, today I wanted to to go over with you kind of the um, the chapters that kick off uh, this book's discussion of uh, of object oriented programming in in R. Um, and uh, this presentation is going to cover the introduction um, to the overall section, um, as well as the the contents of uh, chapter twelve on base types. Um, and I guess probably through what well, probably definitely at the end, I'd, I'd like to hear um, what experience others have with object-oriented programming, whether it's outside of R or, or in R. Um, I have to say that uh, I'm, I'm pretty new to both uh, domains. Uh, so this is an interesting chapter for me to kind of get my, to get my, um, a little more initiated to object-oriented programming. Um, so with that, let me get started. Um, so uh, in, in, in these two kind of chapters, um, I'm going to look at, uh, or rather, we're going to look at what object-oriented programming is in general, um, and then also what how, how it um, manifests itself in, in R. Um, and then also look at tools within R to discern whether an object is a base object or object-oriented object, and then also discern that object's type. This, these things will be useful for, for later chapters as we start talking about classes and dispatch systems. Um, so first, first uh, section um, is, is really about why object-oriented programming is maybe a little hard in R, or at the very least frustrating in R. Um, and um, Hadley puts forward a few reasons, which I've summarized here. Number one is that there are multiple object-oriented programming systems in R, um, most of which we'll see in the book. There's S3, R6, S4, uh, and something that's come out since publication of this book, R7. Um, and, uh, and then also, there doesn't seem to be within the user and or developer community of R any, um, any kind of dominant solution. Um, so you'll find within R people using different systems for different problems, um, either because of individual preferences or simply because a particular problem requires a, a particular type of object-oriented programming system. Um, and then lastly, um, uh, which I guess doesn't affect me as a newcomer to object-oriented programming, is that it seems like there may be limits to how much one's prior experience with uh, object-oriented object-oriented programming can really transfer to R. You know, so if you're a, a C-sharp guru who, who knows, who knows um, everything about object-oriented object -oriented programming, uh, or you've, you've dabbled in, in, in Python or uh, maybe JavaScript, um, you may find some things that are on the surface familiar um, in R, but end up being differently implemented in R than, than elsewhere. Uh, so we've talked about object-oriented programming so far without really defining it. Um, I guess I'll have a few stabs um, at, at defining object-oriented programming, uh, and this tracks a little bit with the discussion in the book. So it seems like there are two, at least two kind of big ideas that, that undergird um, object-oriented programming, uh, polymorphism and an encapsulation. So I'll, I'll kind of tackle each one of these in turn. Um, Polymorphism, in, in short, uh, at least as I understand it, is the idea that a function or some object will have from the outside or kind of, you know, users of the object, uh, whether they be other functions or, you know, people like us working in interactive mode in our studio, they have a single unified interface um, for working with, or working with objects, but inside, um, inside of, uh, of, of these kinds of objects um, and object-oriented programming, uh, there may be several implementations of, of how to return something to, to the, the user, uh, yeah, basically to the user. So maybe to kind of make this a little bit more concrete, I, I've got a, a little kind of a code snippet or I guess pseudo code snippet that's a bit inspired, frankly, by um, Hadley's um, our Studio Conf 2022 talk on R7. Um, so plug plug for that talk if you haven't seen it. Um, do do 
take 20 minutes to watch it. Um, but basically, you know, in R, it might look something like the following. You know, this would be one model, not the only model. You know, let's imagine we have some function um, that that um, takes an object R as an argument and then does something with it. But then, but this function doesn't say and make any real restrictions about what what class of object X is. Uh, so what's nice about this function is that you know you have this this single single kind of touch point with the function and the and the user interface. You just simply provide X, you know, an object X to the function, um, and then inside of the function, um, you might have various implementations of how the function will handle X um, as a function of uh, the class or the type of X. So you might imagine kind of switches like this. You know, if X is numeric, then we have some code on how to, you know, how to implement the, um, well, how to do something with X. Um, if X is, char is a character, um, then how to do that and so on and so forth for, you know, um, you know, as exhaustive a list of, of, um, of, uh, of classes or types of objects as makes sense for the function. So this would be an example of, at least as I understand it, polymorphism. Um, another big idea um, that's kind of related um, is, is encapsulation. And I, I kind of, I think you can think about encapsulation in, in kind of two complementary ways. So one is that you know the function itself sort of encapsulates, and as I put it, like in this inviolate, um, you know, capsule that you know impenetrable capsule, kind of both the data um, that the the object deals with, and then in particular how the how the object deals with that data, so that um, users uh, cannot reach into the object and um, see the internal state of the function or reach into the object and do kind of read write operations except through the interface that the function itself provides so the whole function is is kind of encapsulated in that in that sense another way i, I don't know if this is a good way of thinking about it but as i was doing the notes i thought in a certain sense it's a little bit like a rest like a restful api um and you know you have kind of a client that interacts with the API through a discrete set of endpoints. So kind of methods that the, the API implements um, or attributes about the data that are available through the API. Um, but, but, but the API doesn't grant any additional access to how the API works or the data underlying the API, right? So you can't, uh, I guess unless you're an expert hacker, um, you know, find a way to reach into the database that sits behind an API and kind of pluck out information that you want, um, you know, apart from the way in which the API allows you to, nor can you really kind of look into the server um, and see how the server is executing its business logic. So there's really this kind of separation of concerns, right? Um, that uh, object-oriented uh, functions uh, kind of they take inputs, yield results, and you know the user only really consumes those results um, or can make you know discrete changes to what's going on in the function. So these are the kind of two big ideas behind behind uh, object oriented programming, at least insofar as concerns the the implementation of object oriented programming in R. Uh, you know, I think more generally, there are other big ideas like um, abstraction and things like that. But here, uh, it's polymorphism and, and encapsulation. Um, and then I think these kind of big ideas give rise to kind of a few practical ideas um, that maybe describe a little bit better about how um, object-oriented programming is implemented in general and implemented in, in R in particular. Um, so one practical idea is that objects have class. They have a class, and the class kind of defines several things about the object. The methods, or basically what the object can do, um, um, or what a user can do with the object and talking with the object, um, and then fields, so think data, that can be accessed um, via the object. 
So the class basically defines all of this. It defines what one can do with the object of class, you know, whatever. Um, and it defines the, the data um, that are accessible. So I guess in kind of more object-oriented programming speak, I guess it's more like public methods and then public fields, right? Um, and, and then the other thing that maybe is a little bit of a transition between these two ideas is that objects are an instance of a class. So um, maybe this isn't a very useful analogy, but I always kind of think of, uh, uh, I guess, kind of ancient Greek philosophy and, you know, Plato, Plato discussing, uh, or, or others kind of discussing how, you know, there's this platonic ideal of a thing, and then we find in the world kind of individual instances of that thing that bear some resemblance to this platonic ideal. Um, well, it, it's kind of the same with with uh, with objects of a certain class, except that um, really objects uh, are, are simply instances of a class that inherit inherit basically exhibit all of the salient features, all of the features of that class. Uh, so if you have, you know, something that's S3 class, then R, then it will be S3 class, right? Um, that, that's, that will be the class of the object and that's the way in which it will perform. Um, the second kind of practical idea is that, is that class is inherited. Um, so um, basically, you know, again, since um, class is kind of, uh, you know, it defines an object, sorry. Class kind of defines the object itself. Um, so, in, you know, the, uh, an instance of an object inherits from the class of which it's a member, um, but also um, a class could inherit from the object's kind of parent class. So here are kind of an examples put forward by, by Hadley. Um, let's, let's imagine that, you know, we have an R, you know, an ordered factor. Right, that's the that's the class. Uh, let's just take it as such. Um, so then, something that is a, an object that is of that class is of the class ordered factor. And you know, as a member of that class, it does certain things, has certain you know um, ways that factors can be you know set. We can set or get factors, um, perform operations on ordered factors. But this ordered factor is actually, it, it's, it, it has a parent class of factors more generally, right? Um, and so in that sense, an ordered factor in R um, is indeed an ordered factor. So it's of class ordered, but it's, it, has a, it also inherits the class of its parent class. So you have this kind of hierarchy of classes within, uh, within object-oriented programming um, <clears throat> where, you know, if, if ordered factors are sort of a uh, an extension um, class of factors, then they inherit everything about a factor, and then may have some additional things about them as well. But in particular, that they're ordered in this case. <clears throat> um, Andrew, and, or, sorry, Arthur, Arthur. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Just go ahead, Ryan. I, I was gonna I was gonna add a comment to classification. So another way to think of it is like fruits versus vegetables. Right. So if you have an apple and a strawberry, they're both red. They're both fruit. So they inherit from that class fruit. Um, whereas, I don't know, a vegetable, you have red potatoes and I don't know, some other red vegetable, a, a red pepper. Right. They're red as well, but they're of a different class. So they may have different characteristics, but they're different classifications. You have vegetables and fruit. Now, that logic can go across multiple entities and when we're talking about class and inheritance etc that's another uh non-coding way of thinking of the the same concept yeah thanks ryan um so i guess it's that that kind of on class um and then you know why does kind of class and inheritance of class matter um in in practice it matters at least in R and probably elsewhere and other object-oriented programming systems, insofar, uh, you know, definitely in R, that um, the, the the set of classes uh, that uh, an object has. So, for example, if we go back to our ordered factors, it's of class factor, and it's also of class ordered, right? Um, the inheritance of class, you know, so the class that it is plus any classes it inherits, will determine the way in which um, R um, finds an appropriate method for dealing with this object, 
of, of class. So it'll kind of look through the list of classes and then um, kind of look for inappropriate method. Um, and then, uh, and that process is called, it's called, you know, method dispatch. Um, so for example, if you're doing, dealing with character strings, then R will kind of see the class that, you know, that it's character and then find a method that deals with characters, right? That's, that's kind of the, the idea. That's why this will matter, matter in future as we'll see about um, the, the dispatch system. Um, so this is, I guess the preceding section was a bit about object-oriented programming in general, although we made several references to R. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about object-oriented programming in, in R. Um, so there, there are a few things to, to, to note here, just to give us a little bit a lay of the land um, and, and uh, um, an understanding of kind of how to organize the different in our minds, uh, how to organize in our minds, the different object or basically the different um, OOP systems in, in R. So there are many different paradigms uh, of object-oriented programming that exist. R has principally two of them. Um, uh, so uh, they're, they're called encapsulated object-oriented programming and then functional object-oriented programming. Um, so let's talk a little bit about each in turn. Um, so encapsulated object-oriented programming, you know, this is kind of what we discussed earlier that objects kind of encapsulate both kind of the methods, what can be done with, with, um, with those objects, and then fields, so data that that um, that kind of belong to the object, um, and and then kind of the way in which you would call these these uh, these objects um, kind of communicates to us kind of uh, let's say kind of syn syntactically that that they might belong to. Uh, an encapsulated object-oriented programming system. They'll, they'll have the following forms, right? Where you might have a form of like object dot method and then some, some, function, some function here. Uh, so you can see basically with this that, you know, you have an object and then you have a method that belongs to that object and then something that you're doing with, with that object, right? It's like a functional interface that allows you to do something with, with, with the object, but it belongs uh, it belongs to and is encapsulated by the object itself. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the second, the second system, um, or rather, the second paradigm that exists in R, is is what's called functional object oriented programming. Um, and and in in effect, the way it works. And, and here, I think again, for a very nice understanding. Um, I would refer you to Hadley's excellent um, R Studio Conf 2022 talk. Um, he goes into some he goes into some nice kind of helpful detail about this um, in, in a very approachable way. Um, it, so basically, you'll have you'll have methods that kind of belong to some generic function. So you know the way in which it'll work is you'll have a function that's a generic a generic function, and then you'll have methods that are associated with it. Um, you know, and and basically the way it works is when you when you interact with this generic function, um, you know, it looks like a regular function. You might have something like this generic object and some arguments, um, and then and then the, the the generic function will basically determine the dispatch. Um, so it'll look at um, look at the class of the object that you're passing it. <clears throat> excuse me, that you're passing it, uh, and then. Um, and, and then kind of pass uh, control flow to that function that's appropriate for the class. Um, so in, in, in a sense, like the functional object oriented programming approach is that you have a function, uh, at least as I understand it, you have a, a, like a generic function that, ha that basically is sort of like a, like a channel captain or is, is directing traffic, right? Um, that, that will kind of receive, um, an object and then uh, tell R um, which method uh, to, you know, which uh, method to, to, to use in order to deal with that object. So these are the two paradigms, encapsulated object-oriented programming, functional object-oriented programming. 
Um, and then I just want to give a brief overview of the systems that that exist in 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 R. So we've we saw them earlier here. I wanted to kind of remind us of what what they are, and then provide a little bit more a little more detail. Um, probably if I'd had more time or were smarter, I would have inserted a graphic here. I think, um, but uh, in Basically, in R, you have systems that are available through base R and then systems that are available through packages. Um, so that adds, I guess, additional complication to dealing with object-oriented programming in R. Um, so the one, the systems that exist in base R are S3, S4, and RC. Um, and actually, it turns out for uh, in the book, uh, Hadley does not discuss RC. Instead, he, he discusses R6, which is sort of a, an improvement on RC. Um, anyway, he just provides it here for kind of a complete taxonomy of, of the systems that exist. Um, so the first system is S3. It's, it's uh, you know, here I've just tried to de detail, um, you know, kind of what paradigm it follows, anything noteworthy, noteworthy about it, and then when you might want to, when you might want to use it and any kind of downsides that might exist with its use. Um, so the first was a uh, system is S3, so named because uh, it, it was the object oriented programming that was introduced in the third version of the of S, right? Um, and um, so basically the first two versions did not have an object oriented programming system. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, the paradigm here is the functional object oriented programming. Um, and, you know, Hadley kind of stresses in the book as well as in, uh, you know, again, the excellent um, uh, talk on R7 um, that, you know, S3 is easy to use, um, but is a bit fragile um, in the sense that um, it, it's easy to deploy, but you may not have any real solid guarantees about what's going to come out of it. Here, you know, kind of a shorthand, you might want to think about the difference between per, where, um, you know, then the, like the map family, where you, you know, uh, you have guarantees about the types of objects you're going to that are going to be um, uh, output by per in contrast to kind of uh, the apply family of functions where usually you get what you want, but not always. Um, I think the same is true for, for S3. Um, uh, then there's S4, um, uh, which again is a functional object-oriented programming system. Um, it's a rewrite of S3. Um, and it kind of strikes this, this uh, a different, uh, basically kind of adopts a different trade-off than S3. S3 was kind of low barrier to entry, but also low power. Um, uh, S, S4 is, is um, kind of higher cost of entry, um, but a lot, um, a lot better guarantees about what's going to come out of it. Um, and then RC is is uh, actually here. You know, this is in basis is our first encapsulated object oriented pro programming system. Um, and what's kind of interesting about it, and I think this is probably the way in which the world outside of R functions, is that um, you, you your, your objects end up having kind of like uh, they end up being mutable. So in the sense in the sense that you can modify them in place rather than you know R's usual copy on modify behavior. Um, you know, this makes them very powerful, um, but also makes it rather difficult to reason about what they do since they can be modified in place. So that's for base R. Uh, continue on to, to, to packages. Um, you've got R6, which is uh, an encapsulated uh, object-oriented system. And, and it basically, the shorthand is that it kind of resolves a lot of the problems the users experience with, with RC. Uh, and so Hadley discusses R6 instead of RC in the book for that, that very reason. Um, but it's available as a package. Uh, and then you have R7, um, which, which is uh, um, currently it's a package, but uh, there are hopes that it'll be integrated into base R in future, uh, since it's a joint effort um, between R Consortium, Bioconductor, uh, R Studio, and, and others. Um, and, and the idea here is basically to take the best uh, most compelling features out of both S3 and S4. So notably kind of the ease of entry of S3 and then the power of, of, of S4. Um, I, I don't, I've lost count of how many plugs I've made for the talk, but <laughs> here, if you, when you get, come to the notes, you know, here's a link to the talk. It's, it's really good. Um, 
Uh, right. And then there are a few other systems that exist um, uh, that um, you know, Hadley just kind of uh, provides for, 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 for reference. Um, one that I thought was kind of noteworthy because we end up encountering it, um, uh, rubbing shoulders with it on a, probably a daily basis is the proto system, um, which has a different paradigm than we discussed before. It has a prototype object oriented system, which basically as I understand it says that, you know, objects should follow a certain prototype, you know, they, they should, um, I guess that's kind of a stand in for a cl it's class without being class, I guess, that you have a certain kind of prototype, um, and that every instance of it inherits from that, that, that prototype. Um, and um, kind of noteworthy use of proto is, is, is when ggplot, so uh, ggplot2, uh, you know, if you've ever seen a lot of these errors about something up proto doesn't work in ggplot and that's 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 where you're seeing bubble up from the innards of 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 r um so this is kind of an overview i mean as you can see and this is why i said i probably should have included a graph here uh it seems like predominantly we have functional object oriented programming in r both across you know base and packages um and you know the the ones that we're going to look at in the book are you know s3 s4 and then and then R6, although I'm guessing probably it would behoove us all to kind of look at R7 as well. Um, <clears throat> um, so, yeah, go, go ahead, uh, Ryan, yeah. Sorry, Arthur. Uh, one, one other comment I was going to make about the different types of, of storage or different types of class. Um, excuse me. What I was driving at is the technology of computers as technology has increased and we've introduced uh, new manners or the speed and efficiency of processing data, um, it has a direct reflection on these different types of uh, service. So that the S3 versus S4 and then going into R6 versus R7, like you just, if you, if you span that across the history of development in computer architecture, it also, uh, in storage, uh, spindle drives versus solid state drives versus compact flash or any other form of, of uh, solid state media. That's another way that you could uh, approach this topic and it would yield the same concepts. So there is a reason why we have these different um, architectures and because we have, because R is a very open source spec, uh, tool, um, and we have different operating systems, different uh, means in which we're managing information. Um, they're complementary of all those different operating systems as well. Cool, thanks, Ryan. Um, and also, um, maybe I guess uh, in terms of where uh, just another, and I don't know why, but this bubbled in my mind as I was, I was hearing you talk. Um, you know, I mean, I guess there are kind of a few noteworthy implementations of of these. I, um, for for example, in um, in in I guess the shiny world, I, I see R6 uh, a lot. Um, you know, one is uh, I think John Cohen's uh, waiter package, which kind of provides these CSS spinners. Um, and, and then others where, you know, I kind of see this, um, uh, I think Hadley kind of calls it um, non-idiomatic R syntax, uh, where, where R6 is being used, that you're you know, seeing something that looks at odds with your kind of mental model about how R6, or how, our syntax should should look, um, and then you know for S3, uh, if you'll recall, kind of thinking back, um, you know we had all of these uh, like date time et cetera that utilize S3 under under the hood. I don't recall, however, if we've we talked about S4, um, but I mean I, all that to say this, I think these things uh, are already in our are already in our lives and our everyday workflows, and probably having a little deeper understanding of how they work will probably help us with those, those tools. Yeah. Um, so I guess we'll move over from the overview of, of, of object-oriented programming in R to um, uh, what is really kind of more the main content of the base types chapter. Um, it, I found it to be kind of a, a strange chapter um, in, insofar as it seemed to have fairly limited, uh, limited scope, although I guess it probably is setting the stage for what will what will come um, in, in the future. Um, and anyway, there's one large section that I'll kind of go through uh, it, it, talking about, you know, how can you tell if 
an object kind of caught in the wild is a base object or is an uh, OOP, like an OO object. Um, and there are two there are two ways in which uh, with R functions you can you can tell. Um, one is this uh, base R function is object, uh, which will yield a, a true or false if um, uh, depending on uh, whether your the object uh, that you pass it is or is not an uh, an OO object. Um, and, and then this other function, um, I, I was uh, sloop uh, or sorry, this other package sloop. Uh, I'm not sure what the SL stands for, but you know the OOP is object oriented programming. I, I, I assume. Um, uh, has this function called O type, which is basically object type, which will which will tell you what type of object you're you're dealing with, right? So let's see these two in action because I imagine we'll be using these um, in in future sections on S3 and S4. I'm I'm not looked I'm not looked too far ahead, but I, I strongly suspect that that's the case. So let's take a first example where we have a base a base R object. So just a you know a numeric array. Um, and so if we determine, you know, if we try to assess whether it is an object, we see that we get back false. So it's not an object oriented object, it's a base object. Um, and then if we look at the object type here, um, uh, we'll see that it's it's of type base. Um, and now let's take kind of an object oriented object, um, a data frame. Um, so if we if we try to discern whether that object is is a is an is an object oriented object with this function is object, uh, return value will be true. Um, and then if we try to determine what type it is, um, we'll see that it's an S three an S three object. So a data a data frame is a is an S three object, as I think we we also saw um, in earlier chapters. Um, uh, so these are the functions that are available to you. Um, one kind of distinct, distinctive feature uh, about object-oriented objects in in R is that is that they have class. Um, I don't mean that in kind of the complementary uh, sense of they're classy and and nice, uh, you know, have bright teeth and a wonderful smile. Uh, instead, I mean that they have a class attribute that's associated with the object. Um, so. Um, you know, if we look at again at our, our our numeric vector and try to get the class attribute from the object, the return value is null. So this object, which we know to be a base object, has no class, right? Whereas if we do the same with empty cars, which is uh, you know a data frame, uh, and we get the class attribute from empty cars, we'll see that it's a data a data frame, right? Uh, so with these kind of two objects, you have kind of functions. Well, in the book, they break this up, although I guess in a principle, they're just different ways of kind of um, with your eyes closed, kind of trying to feel the elephant and see if it's an elephant or something else. Um, it is kind of discerning what type of objects you're dealing with. Um, you know, this is object command, um, which tells whether an object is an object-oriented object or not. Um, sloops, O-type function, which will give you the um, the type uh, of the object, uh, and then the class, uh, which will get the, the class attribute, or I guess class attributes, plural, um, uh, from, from an object. Um, so, so far we've, we've talked about kind of object type and class, but we've not talked about kind of the types uh, of an object. So, as we just saw, object-oriented object-oriented objects are unique in that they have a class attribute. Um, so only those types of objects have an uh, have a class attribute. But every object, regardless of whether it's OO or base, um, has a has a, um, has a type. Um, uh, sorry, that should be type right there. I'll have to fix that. Um, and 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 I'll we'll kind of look at these in 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 turn um, in the section two. Um, uh, Hadley draws our attention to how many of these uh, types um, map to types in in C um, uh, or, or C 
plus plus one of the two um, uh, basically kind of at the at the implementation level uh, because sometimes there's this this mapping between well, let's see kind of like find find distinctions between types uh, that we see as our users that may not make a whole lot of difference in our lives but that are meaningful at the level at the implementation level in C so if you look at vectors, you know, if you have the type of null, that it's null, uh, if you look at the type of a character vector, your character vector, et cetera. Functions also, <clears throat> uh, also have types. Um, so this I actually thought interesting because I, I didn't realize that this was the case. If you take a, you know, kind of air quotes, normal function, um, here I've got some my function that's just um, taking as an argument X and then adding one to it. Um, if I look at the type of that, it ends up being a closure, which is kind of kind of interesting. Um, and so this is this is the type of normal functions, kind of the functions that you and I would make or that would belong to packages. Um, and but there are also other types of functions that have different types uh, that I guess are worth worth noting here. Um, if we look at if we look at kind of the um, the selection uh, operator um, in you know for vectors for lists so the square bracket um, you look at the type and it's type special um, again this has some correspondence in C um, and, and then there are also uh, functions that have a type uh, of uh, built in and Hadley you know the book calls these primitive functions where the implementation I think is is solely in in in, in C um, for um, um, performance reasons. Um, and then if you look at environment, you know, environment has a type of environment. Um, now, I guess we get a little uh, interesting, more interesting parts. Um, S4, uh, so we take an S4 uh, object, so, uh, the, uh, and we look at it, you know, it'll be type, type S4. Um, and then we look at kind of language components. And this, I think, is interesting, probably sets the stage a little bit for future chapters come, you know, like, 20, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22. Um, you know, if we look at, uh, you know, we'll just imagine that there is in the environment some object named A. Uh, we quote that object, and the type of that thing is a symbol. Okay? Um, if we take, uh, if we have an expression and quote the expression, um, then it's of type language. Uh, and then lastly, um, if we wanted to kind of inspect the internals, um, or actually, maybe not the internals, but if, if we inspect the formals, uh, so these are the arguments basically of, of, of a function. So this is actually the little uh, plaything function that I defined earlier. Um, then, then we end up with a type pair list. So I guess it's key, key value pairs, key being name and then the value being whatever we pass to the function um, right now one thing that we didn't we didn't really touch on so much and you know Hadley draws our attention to this is is is, is a numeric is a numeric type in R and yeah you know, the, the thing that he, the point he wants to make in this kind of a little bit of an aside in, in, in the chapter is that we need to be careful about numeric type because R top talks variously about numeric um, in in different contexts, um, and in in the book, he'll have a certain use. It. When he says numeric, he'll mean a certain thing. Uh, so often, you know, numeric is is kind of treated to be like synonymous of double, right? To kind of see how this is the case, um, let's consider let's consider the uh, uh, um, an as numeric function, right? So in its name, it says as numeric. So it seems like there's a type kind of coercion to numeric type, um, but actually it ends up creating a double. Uh, so let's let's take, you know, one, we'll define one as equal to one as a double implicitly. One L, which, you know, will be an integer here. We look at the type of each, we find what we expect. Um, you know, one is a double, one L is an integer. And then now let's kind of check their type after, after passing them through um, as numeric. And you'll see here that both of them end up being um, a double. So this is, you know, one case among many. Uh, Hadley mentions a few functions here, where this this kind of um, label of numeric doesn't mean what it seems to mean, right? Instead, here it means 
it means double. Um, and also in S3 and S4, you know, numeric is taken to be either integer or double when choosing the method. So here, for example, if you use Sloop's uh, function, you know, the S3 class of something, uh, here I'll look at, you know, um, uh, a double, and I'll look here at a uh, an integer. You'll see that, you know, we have a vector of classes um, where, you know, you'll have double as as for both, and then kind of an underlying numeric class for for each. So that'll be meaningful for the kind of the choice of dispatch method. Um, and and then also kind of you have this case where you know is numeric test whether an object again you know we saw as numeric which kind of is a type conversion now we have is numeric which is a, kind of a a validator function in a certain sense um, that's looking to see here not whether the object is numeric but instead whether it behaves like a numeric uh, so to make this point, Hadley kind of draws our attention to factors, which, uh, you know, as we'll re recall, are, um, you know, are integers that have other attributes about them. Uh, so if you look at, you know, factor X and you look at the type of it, it turns out to be integer. Um, but if you, you use the is numeric on, on, on that, then it, uh, then it turns out not to be, not to be numeric since the factor here doesn't, doesn't behave like a number. Um, and, you know, Hadley just mentions here that for consistency in, in, in following chapters, whenever he, uh, whenever the book says numeric, what's meant is that it's uh, either um, something of integer or double type. Yep. Okay. Um, and I guess with that, I'll, I'll stop um, and see if there are any kind of questions or, or comments. This, these two chapters ended up being a little bit, um, they felt a little disjointed at parts, but uh, certainly in the introduction um, to the section was helpful in setting the stage about what object-oriented programming looks like in, in, in R. And then this will be my last plug for it. Um, <laughs> in addition to reading the book, I would, I would strongly advise all of us to kind of have a look at Hadley's, um, Hadley's uh, uh, RStudio Conf 2022 talk on the R7 class because it gives a very approachable overview of the systems that it, well, the main base systems that exist, S3, S4, um, and then talks about um, R7 in that context. And in the process, uh, ends up talking about object-oriented programming a bit a bit more generally, again, in a very approachable manner. Uh, yeah. Uh, to to you guys, uh, to see if you have any questions or comments or, or wanted to share any kind of experiences with object-oriented programming, outside of R and kind of draw some comparisons, favorable or not, uh, with, with, with R. All right, over to you guys. Oh, go ahead, Ryan. It's okay. I, I, I may be long-winded. Uh, go ahead if you want. Oh, I was just going to say that I don't really have object-oriented experience outside of R. Um, yeah, I, I'll just echo what Arthur said earlier and um, the, the kind or type I'm interested in is R6, especially with regards to uh, Shiny and how it can be used with Shiny. Um, and that's partly why I chose that chapter. But yeah, interested to hear what you have to say, Ryan. Well, I I, I want to be forward to the group and, and anybody that watches the video. Um, I actually failed out of my C++ class. That was actually one of the uh, primary reasons I left the computer science uh, field of study. Um, I ended up switching gears and going with information systems management instead. But what I learned during that uh, exposure, uh, Java and C++, um, it isn't as complicated as it sounds. So there's some very core base concepts to get in, in, in your head, and that's inheritance, encapsulation, polymorphism, et cetera. 
if you want to throw in recursion into the mix, uh, that's usually a very confusing topic as well. Where I started to gain in maturity of the subject of object-oriented programming was as I switched gears into different operating systems. And then that led, led, uh, leads itself into um, different manners in which architectures are built. And so what I'm referring to there is um, the Windows architecture versus Linux versus Mac. Um, when we talk about R as a subject and specifically this chapter in object-oriented programming, the, the idea or the plan that I would, I would want to pressure anybody into is from a history perspective. So Arthur, your, your earlier comment of, of questioning C or C++, uh, everything is usually base C um, from, from the concept of R's architecture. There are packages or there is a package uh, that complements C++ and that's the RCPP um, package. So that does add some C++ uh, concepts into play um, where I started to get a lot more confidence in the nomenclature or language about object oriented programming and or these different class types is stepping back and looking from a global perspective of that management style. And that's where I'm referring to as the Windows versus Linux versus Mac. Um, it gives a better purview and relationship. Um, I would encourage any person, if you are in question of any of these details, very much read up on, on the subjects beyond what you're just finding in this advanced art book, um, because they are core. They are very much uh, directly related to your success in authoring both scripting, um, the sometimes odd uh, errors that we get out of our programs. Um, there are reasons why that's happening and to don't assume that the computer is doing something like, you know, give the computer a personality that doesn't work that way. Uh, computers are just dumb logic. So um, they're always, there's going to be an answer. It just depends on how far in depth you want to dig to find the answer. Um, the last comment I would make is, is protocols. Um, and this is going back again to my earlier comment about maturity. So getting to the protocol of, of what it is you're doing to get the answer that you're driving for to figure out why either an error is happening or you know why is this package using this particular uh, object storage. Um, dig into that uh, reasoning because there, there, there is a concept, uh, Trev, in your statement of the R6 class and the shiny concept, um, start to read into the JavaScript world or, or read into the web development world of, of how that works. And then you'll start to comprehend the reasons why that classification is more, or that object is more appropriate for that uh, type of uh, technology. So I'll cap off with this. Um, I, I do also encourage anybody that wants to go back and just read about Fortran, COBOL, and uh, all of our um, the way technology is, has moved forward. Um, you will still find uh, older protocols in play. Um, and that's also helpful um, for why all of these different mechanisms are, are still supported. Anyway, that's all I had, Arthur. Yeah, thank, <clears throat> excuse me, thanks, thanks Ryan. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I guess I wanted to um, maybe kind of share um, maybe kind of a question to the group, I, I, I suppose. Um, so I, I was kind of thinking, um, you know, one thing that interests me as kind of a, a hobbyist uh, or a package developer is, you know, let's let's say that um, in future, I, I develop some, some package that, um, that deals with, you know, that deals with um, object oriented, um, objects um you know right now i could kind of get a lay of the land and figure out which objects exist and how to deal with them but you know definitely in future there may well be different objects object or well different classes that'll come to exist right and 
um, you know, I guess kind of what I'm I'm wondering about, and hopefully this book will <clears throat> maybe maybe delve into this briefly, um, unless this is treated in the Hadley's R packages uh, book, is is kind of how to think about developing packages with with that in mind. Um, I guess, or well, and maybe kind of like an adjunct to that is, um, you know, so I guess the people that could modify your functions would be would be you as the author. So if you're doing something like this, um, where all of the methods are strictly contained in the function, they're the only person that could make changes to the function, uh, to kind of the scope of the function, the scope of objects that are that are kind of supported by the function would be the author themselves or contributors to, to the package. But, um, you know, with object oriented programming, at least some kind of paradigms of it, it seems like one can create extension methods that sort of, as I understand it, sit outside of the function. Um, uh, and I'm kind of wondering, you know, what what advice the book might 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 have for that. Um, you know, one that I I uh, run into kind of frequently uh, myself is uh, I, for my for my day job, I'm I'm using a lot of uh, uh, well, I'm dealing a lot of a lot with data data files, um, and 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 one I think um, very highly commendable thing that that in the, that is common in the data world is that. You know, data are are labeled, uh, so you can have variable labels that describe what the variable contains. It's basically metadata, metadata um, for the variables and metadata for individual values. Let's say if you have a categorical answer, you know, one is yes and two is no, for example. Um, well, you know, one thing that I kind of end up running into frequently is that some packages, um, I guess the package that that allows for this this um, uh, usage of um, oops, sorry um, of of label data is is Haven, um, which allows you to ingest external files and also has kind of methods for converting um, this metadata into something sensible in R. Um, but when I want to perform computations <laughs> or do data manipulations, sometimes sometimes I'll I'll, I'll get error message saying you know class labeled is not supported <laughs> and 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 then you know i'll have to do some kind of class conversion if i can put it that way that i'll just uh, haven has some methods for stripping out metadata and in, in so doing changing um changing a column from a labeled class to being kind of the base um the blade the bait like more base um type uh that it is but I, anyway this is kind of a long a long kind of setup but i'm, I'm kind of wondering you know um, how 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 best to deal with this as kind of package authors uh, or you know how to deal with these kind of scenarios. Um, I mean, one thing that Hadley makes clear in the book is that new base types are very rare. Um, you know, I, I can't remember. He mentions one of the la last ones, and I think it was in 2015 or something like that. Um, uh, but but at the same time. Because of the vibrant R community and ecosystem, there are lots of classes being generated by the day, um, and yet, you know, packages may not deal well with those. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, given that challenge, how we as package authors or we as package users could somehow take advantage of the fact that um, these these object oriented objects. Um, you know, depending on how they're constructed, um, may allow for the possibility of creating new extension methods um, for 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 um, for dealing with them in certain you know base functions, right? Uh, so, like dplyr, if I wanted to do like a summarize function, for example, um, you know maybe it doesn't deal with the labeled class, but it deals with the base class. Well, is there a way for me somehow? Um, to set the stage either as package author or package user to write an extension method that'll <laughs> stop errors from popping up in my console or, or you know, just handle these different types of objects in a sensible way. Anyway, uh, in, end of monologue, I guess. And uh, I don't know if anyone has any 
uh, has any re reactions or uh, additional grievances with <laughs> kind of the R ecosystem and classes. I don't have any directly to the ecosystem necessarily um, related to the package development concept. Um, you can always inherit from other packages as well. Um, so if you are in the midst, Arthur, of, of building your own package, um, you can draw from Haven, right? Put it as a dependency and then have that uh, also pull into your, your uh, namespace so that while you're working um, with your package that you're authoring, you're accessing other utilities within Haven as well. Uh, that might help. Um, one of the things that I, I guess I'm driving for, or, or maybe I'm not completely uh, conveying what's what's bouncing in my head. It's all about the management of information. So depending on, like you had stated, the storage of that media, right? If it is the data value, or the state of information, <clears throat> and it doesn't match. Um, within the R's services to be able to manipulate, right? Reordering it. <clears throat> and I, I, I look at that as almost like a, a protocol translation kind of thing, right? Um, UTF-8 kind of concept. Um, if your character references or the classification of that value is not appropriate, what service can I deploy that would make it familiar with um, R or any of the functions within R that can access that that uh, value uh, or data set or whatever, whatever data frame table concept. The um, in the in the package development concept, one of the, the key elements is that you don't want to modify your user's computer. So um, that's actually taboo. You don't ever want to do that. Um, if you were to deploy your package, you're not going to modify or change anything about that user's infrastructure that they're rendering your package in. Um, they can install it and then access the functions maintained within, uh, but you're, you're, you're locked in within that. Um, you're not able to go outside the bounds because now you start to get into some other issues, security risks, et cetera, that would prevent you from doing that. Um, there are tests that you can run to confirm that. And then the second comment I would add in when you compile for package development, it is going to generate different binary forms. So you'll you'll get a Linux version and a Windows-based version or a Mac version. Um, you can you can generate it out into that uh, architecture as well. Does that help? Yeah, no, I I think it does help, Ryan. Um, yeah, I I appreciate what you're saying about kind of um, trans you know translating between um systems a little bit uh yeah I, 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 nevertheless i'm still kind of wondering you know how to go about um handling this issue of like accommodating making making functions and you know packages that kind of group them together sort of open to extension in in a way that's not just um you know i i write the package haven 2 which is like separate from Haven and, and uses a lot of the core, but instead it's sort of like a, um, a Haven add-on, for, for example. Um, you know, granted those functions could well be grouped, you know, would, sens would be sensible to be grouped in a package, but have some kind of extension methods that are, that are made available to other users as um, that kind of build off of, um, build off of, you know, some other package. But I, I, in order for that to happen, what I'm, what I'm thinking is, you know, if I'm a package author, I shouldn't write my functions this way. Um, you know, instead I should kind of uh, have you know, like, again, this, this more generic where I have a generic function and the generic function points to methods, right? And then maybe, maybe the method is something that's outside of the package itself, right? I don't know if that's allowed within, within ours kind of, um, package ecosystem, if, if, if you can have a package that sort of provides extension methods for, or other packages, if those kind of like the package or packages that serve as like your, your building blocks are, are constructed in an open way um, where, you know, you, someone could add extension methods to them, whether it's the author of the package themselves or someone, you know, providing, as I was saying, like an extension method that's, that's, 
outside of um, outside of that. I'm not, I'm not sure if that makes sense. I mean, you know, as, uh, looking through source code, oftentimes I'll see, you know, um, although I don't do this often enough, uh, and I'll look through kind of source code and, and I'll see, you know, uh, like use method, and then it'll point to kind of like a method that's defined within the package itself, right? Um, and I, I don't know if the same could be done, but like outside of the confines of the package, um, if that would be a sensible thing to do. Anyway, and just just kind of a something that I'm hoping to learn more about um, as as we kind of progress through this book, and maybe I'll I'll try to spend some time looking at at source code as well, or see if I can find other other um, other packages that do this. Like you know, coming back to my Stata exam example, which may not be close enough to everyone's experience, but there's this other package called Labeled, which um, provides. Uh, I mean, definitely it provides an interface, like maybe a more like ergonomic interface for working with the metadata that um, you could either set on, a, you know, a, let's say an otherwise metadata free data frame or that you could, um, or, or where you can manipulate some of the metadata that comes with the data set read in from Stata, SPSS, SAS, or something like that. I'll have to look and see if this, how it implements that, whether it's just a separate set of methods that that kind of, you know, yes, take Haven as a dependency, but don't otherwise, like, let's say, like, formally provide extension methods for Haven, but kind of indirectly provide other tools that do Haven-like things in ways that Haven doesn't anticipate. So it's like a, a complementary package rather than a package that has, it's a little bit kind of closer that provides an extension. Well, and I think those are both positives and negatives to the open source world, right? It's the ability of, of mirroring or extending uh, uh, something that you find as potentially limiting, and then you create your own environment beyond that uh, with the intent that it's going to be used by the world. The, it's, it's noisy, right? There's just a lot of options out there and figuring out what is the best opportunity, or, or maybe I don't know that it's out there yet. I uh, haven't discovered it yet. Um, the, the, that's not just an R packaging ecosystem error. That's just open source in general, because anybody can create whatever they want kind of concept. Um, I was going to piggyback on Trevin made a comment in the, in the message thread. There is a probably going to be a new R packages book club that will be starting. And yes, without question, a hundred percent, the book has changed, <laughs> dramatically changed. Um, that happened right at the uh, conference uh, this year. Uh, they released the uh, updated uh, addition to the second edition to the document, and it completely rewrote, rewrote the entire table of contents of, of, of the previous first edition. So just be aware of that when you're reading it. Oh, nice. I wasn't I wasn't aware of that, but that's that's very that's definitely very good to know. Um, yeah, because I know the conference did some stuff or well, yeah, there's a whole workshop. Um, I think it was the one that, that Trevin followed um, that dealt with kind of, uh, or maybe it was Hadley's, uh, uh, where it was basically kind of talking about tools to make packages and their functions more user-friendly. So a lot of it was just kind of having helpful error messages issued in, in at the console through kind of like going through the CLI, um, CLI uh, package. Um, Anyway, thanks. Thanks for the thanks for the resource. Anything else from anybody? Or um, I think we're kind of a little bit over time. Nope. Uh, thanks, Arthur. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone signed up for next week, but that may be something uh, we all want to check out. Yeah, not, not yet, it seems. Cool. Okay. Well, um, everybody have a, have a great week. Um, we'll talk again in one week, um, kind of live, and then in the intervening times over Slack. Thanks again for bearing with me and, um, you know, my, my, my amateur newbie um, attempt to kind of describe object-oriented programming, and also thanks for bearing with my, my voice. <laughs> All right. All the best. See ya. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.